Number 40 says, in some places and circumstances, however, an even more radical adaptation of the liturgy is needed, and this entails greater difficulties, difficulties for this reason. Number one, the competent territorial ecclesiastical authority mentioned in Article 22.2 must in this matter carefully and prudently consider which elements from the traditions and cultures of individual peoples might appropriately be admitted into divine worship. Adaptations which are considered useful or necessary should then be submitted to the Holy See, by whose consent they may be introduced. This is why we get all the weird, funny, and crazy liturgies going on when the Pope travels. Sometimes when the Pope celebrates a Mass, there's practically nothing left of the traditional rites. Nothing. To the point that, uh, by the way, this will uh, cause great scandal, but it should be known, that when the Pope said Mass in Vienna, with his obsession of the vernacular, he was calling Our Lady Grandmother. Instead of Gottesmutter in German, he said Großmutter Maria. See, if that had happened in Latin, nobody would have noticed it, at least. <laughs> and there was, there was, this is an inside information. Some people will deny that, but I don't care. There was an investigation in the Holy Office on the validity of the Papal Mass in Vienna. Because he omitted, by mistake, of course, he, omi he omitted something in the words of consecration. I, I absolutely, I'm, I'm, I'm personally absolutely convinced this was only a mistake. However, this would not have happened in a Latin rite. This would not have happened if the Pope says every day of his life, hocus denim corpus meo, hicus denim calic sanguinis mei, novit eterni testamenti, mysterium fide, qui provis et promultis et fondeto in remissionem peccatorum, equotius cumque feceritis in me memoriam patietis. I know the Mass by heart. The Ordo Missa, at least. I really know it by heart. And you have to. It has to become a holy, a sacred routine. Because if it does not become a holy, a sacred routine, I'm not talking about Buddhists rattling with their uh, prayer mills. <laughs> it has to become a holy and sacred routine because otherwise you would make horrible mistakes at Mass. Sometimes a priest is too tired. Sometimes he had to get up too early. Sometimes he has to say the Mass too late. Sometimes he's sick. Sometimes he's just confused because we are human beings and things may happen to us that cause great confusion. Sometimes we are not really present at Mass spiritually. I mean, uh, sometimes uh, it, 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 it happens, believe me, it happens that after Mass you say, did I say Mass? You have a scheduled Mass 7 in the morning, which for me is awful. You have a scheduled Mass 7 in the morning in the parish, and for some reason, maybe it's your fault because you went to a celebration and didn't come home to, to uh, right in, in time. Maybe it's not your fault because you had to uh, give the sacraments to a dying person. You had to assist somebody with extreme unction and, uh, and, and the viaticum, the last rites, and you come back at 3 o'clock at night, and then you have to say Mass at 7, and you're really standing there like a zombie celebrating, you better have developed a holy, sacred routine in doing this, because otherwise you might just forget the words of consecration. This is another one of, this is another aspect, an evil aspect of the new Mass. When you are a traveling bishop and priest in our days, you have to say the Mass in 50 languages. That's not possible. But Vatican II wanted it. Don't say Vatican II didn't want that. Number 40 says they want it. In number 43, they say, zeal for the promotion and restoration of the sacred liturgy is rightly held to be the sign of the providential dispositions of God in our time and as a movement of the Holy Spirit in his church. It is today a distinguishing mark of the life of the church and indeed of the whole tenor of contemporary religion through thought, religion, thought, and action. So they are really messianic about their reforms. So the Messiah wants the reform. The liturgical reform is dictated by the Holy Spirit. I can't blame John Paul II on calling Vatican II a second Pentecost and something the Holy Spirit made. If they say it, they say it. And they, they insist it's today. It is today a distinguishing mark of the life of the church. Yes, it is a distinguishing mark of the life of agnostic sect called the Church of the New Advent. And indeed, the whole tenor of contemporary religious thought and action. But it's not the tenor of my religious thought. 
and it's not the tenor of my religious actions. I don't want the reform, and I deny the reform. I reject the reform. It's illegitimate against the will of God. But they say, they, they attribute a, a messianic message to it. Now, finally, we will convert the whole world with a new liturgy. That's probably the reason all the people are converted so much today that they don't need to go to church anymore, which is the reason why churches are empty and seminaries are empty. In number 44, the council says, it is desirable that the competent territorial ecclesiastical authority mentioned in Article 22.2, I'm sorry I bore you with this Article 22.2, but they do. Article 22.2 set up a liturgical commission to be assisted by experts. We got them again. What experts? What experts? The Tridentine Council said a lot about Mass. The popes have said a lot about Mass. Pius XII was an, a real expert when he wrote Mediator Day. I don't need experts. I have Mediator Day. I have all the beautiful, beautiful writings of the Church Fathers, of the popes, of the councils, of the saints. What do I need experts for? I need an expert to repair my fridge, <laughs> not liturgy. <laughs> to be assisted by experts in the liturgical science, sacred music, art, and pastoral practice. As far as possible, the commission should be ad aided by some kind of institute for pastoral liturgy. Well, we got them uh, uh, growing like mushrooms now, consisting of people who are eminent. Excuse me. Uh, my eyes are getting old. Consisting of people who are eminent in these matters. Yes. You know what I would have said, hopefully, what I would have said being present in the, in the sacred aula in, in St. Peter's Basilica at the council, I would have raised my, my hand and said, yes, why don't you read Mediator Day by Pius XII? He was a competent man, and he was an expert on liturgy, even if he didn't show it all the time in his actions, in his writings he did. So... If circ I, I read again, I'm sorry I interrupted this. As far as possible, the commission should be aided by some kind of institute for pastoral liturgy, consisting of people who are eminent in these matters, not excluding laymen, if circumstances demand. It will be the task of this commission, under the direction of the above-mentioned competent territorial ecclesiastical authority, see Article 22.2, to regulate pastoral liturgical action throughout the territory and to promote studies and necessary experiments whenever there is a question of adaptations to be proposed to the Holy See. So now the council that claims that everything has to be according to sound tradition says we want experiments, liturgical experiments. Um, at a Holy Mass, if it was a Holy Mass, I don't know, in the seminary in Vienna, in Austria, they replaced the readings of St. Paul with a reading from Peter Handke, who is a communist German author. And when Cardinal Koenig was asked, uh, how come, how is this possible, he said, oh, it's an interesting liturgical experiment. I need a gulp of wine after that. <laughs> so let's forget St. Paul, he was against women anyway. Let's, re let's read Karl Marx. In number 50, the council wants us to simplify. The right of mass is to be revised in such a way that the intrinsic nature and purpose of its several parts, as well as the connection between them, may be more clearly manifested, and that devout and active participation by the faithful, we heard that before, may be more easily achieved. For this purpose, the rites are to be simplified, due care being taken to preserve their substance, facts, or excuse me, parts, which with the passage of time came to be duplicated or were added with little advantage are to be omitted. First of all, this is an impertinence first class to say that uh, there are parts in the old mass that were added with little advantage. The council fathers at Trent would have kicked this guy out who said that. And Vatican II now wants, for this purpose, the rights are to be simplified. The very concept of simplifying the rights has been condemned by Pope Pius VI in Octorum Fide as rash and offensive to pious ears. How dare the Council Fathers at Vatican II now to request something that was condemned by a previous pope? 
When a pope condemns something, no one of his successors may change that. A priest in this country, geographically not far from here, said that the pope cannot bind his successor. I explained in my other tape, and Father Paul Kramer in his book explains very well that this is not true. The pope binds his successors in everything that is not disciplinary positive law. Disciplinary laws, he does not bind his successors, of course not. In positive law, that means the great major part of canon law, he does not bind his successors. If the Pope decides to change the, uh, the, uh, the, the law of election to the papacy, he may do so. Many popes did that. The present Pope did it. And the next Pope will be elected to the law established by John Paul II, rightly so. But the Pope cannot change the faith. You read that in Denzinger Schönmetzer 3070, the fourth chapter of the Constitutio Dogmatica Pastoriternus de Ecclesia Christi of the 18th of July, 1870, at First Vatican Council, defining the infallibility of the Pope. And in the fourth chapter, the Council says, Spiritus Sanctus non enim, datus est successoribus Petri, ut eo revelante, aliquam novam doctrinam patefacerent, said, ut eo assistente, traditam per apostolos revelationem seo fidei depositum sancte custodieren et fidelit exponeren. The Holy Spirit was not promised to the successors of Peter, so with his uh, revealing, uh, they may proclaim a new doctrine, but that with his assistance, they may wholly sa sa uh, sancte, that's uh, difficult in, in, in English, they may in a holy way guard it and explain it faithfully. What do they have to guard and explain? They have to guard and explain the depositum fide, that means the faith that was handed down to us from the apostles. So a pope can very well bind his successor with that. When a pope proclaims a dogma, nobody, not even the conciliar church, doubts I mean, the conciliar church may be, but not, uh, not the pope, the pres not the present pope. Uh, the pope may not change around the dogma. He's bound by his predecessor. The pope may not change things of the faith. If Pope uh, Pius IX condemned the idea of separation of church and state, the present pope may not request the contrary. He's bound. A decision in moral theology of a pope binds his successors. And this is the reason why in the same dogmatic constitution on the papal infallibility, the, uh, the, uh, the council, the Vatican I, actually says that the Pope holds, now listen to this distinction, the Pope holds the primacy, non solum rebus fidei et morum, sed etiam reginis et disciplina ecclesia. He does not hold the primacy only in the matters of faith and morals, but also in the matters of government and discipline of the church. So now, they make a very important distinction. Distinction. It is understood anyway that he holds the primacy in matters of faith and morals. But he also holds the primacy in matters of discipline and mm -hmm. government of the church. So there's two levels here. A pope cannot bind his successor in a law of discipline and government. But he can very well and does bind his successor in a matter of faith and morals. The church has always said that. The popes have sworn that as the oath of incarnation in writing from 678 to 1302, that we have in writing. So most probably by 678, the popes had sworn to that already for many centuries. And after 1302, the popes certainly uh, lived in the same spirit, which is proven by church history, by the teaching of the popes, and by tradition. The pope is bound to tradition. The pope is a subject to tradition. And if a pope makes something part of tradition, if a pope declares that something is part of tradition, he binds his successor. So you cannot turn these things round. And if uh, uh, Pope Pius VI condemned the idea of uh, uh, simplifying the rights, then Paul VI is bound to that. In number 54, the council says, a suitable place may be allotted to the vernacular in masses. Aha, again which are celebrated with the people, 
but our masses should be celebrated with the people, the council says. So a suitable place has to be allotted to the vernacular in all masses. See how you have to read the council, the context. See what the context is? Especially in the reading and the common prayer, and also as local conditions may warrant in those parts which pertain to the people, according to the rules laid down in Article 36 of, this con of, of the Constitution. Article 36 is referring to 22.2. We got that again. Wherever a more extended use of the vernacular and the mass seems desirable, the regulations laid down in Article 40 of this Constitution to be observed. What does the Article 40 of this Constitution say? Well, the Article 40 says, in some places and circumstances, however, an even more radical adaptation of the liturgy is needed. And it refers to 22.2 again. So let the bishops' conferences write up new rights. You see the context? If you read Vatican II in context and with references, you cannot say they didn't want the vernacular new right. Then it says, Communion under both kinds may be granted when the bishops think fit. When the bishops think fit. Now they don't even say 22-2. They say when the bishops think fit. So let, let's dis, let's dis, distribute communion under both kinds. The Council of Trent said that's no good and it shouldn't be done. The Council of Vatican I says yes, it might be done. The bishops decide. Not only to clerics and religious, but also to the laity. I can't read this. In cases to be determined by the Apostolic See. For example, to the newly ordained in the mass of their ordination, to the newly professed in the mass of their religious profession, to the newly baptized in the mass which follow their baptism, and so on. After this, after the council, you know what happened? They found blood stains. I call them blood stains, but more, probably the mass was not valid anyway, then it was wine stains, in the wall-to-wall -wall carpet of a church, of many churches, of many churches. So... Uh, a lot of Catholics and Protestants and Protestants signed a letter to the Holy See saying, why please explain to us if the Catholic Church says this is the blood of Christ, why do you distribute communion under both kinds if that is the result, if you get those stains in carpets? That was at the time when uh, Virgilio Noé was a prefect of the Congregation for the Sacred Rites. You know how he answered the congregation, wrote a letter to the American Bishops' Conference, and gave them the faculty to decide freely when, when communion may be distributed under both kinds. So that means today, Rome is in a condition that when you point out a sacrilege and danger to the Blessed Sacrament to Rome, Rome will enlarge the faculties for this sacrilege, not condemn them. This is how they interpret Vatican II. Some irreformable people who are not willing to learn try over and over again to explain to me that Vatican II is not as bad as I make it. They are so wrong about it. Who is the authority to interpret Vatican II? The Pope and the bishops or I? Well, look what the Pope and the bishops make of Vatican II. The present Pope is quoting Vatican II, Vatican II, Vatican II, Vatican II. See what he does. See what he decides. The bishops are always talking about the spirit of Vatican II. They quote Vatican II. They quote Vatican II. They quote Vatican II. See what they do. Sacrilegious, sacrilegious, sacrilegious. The Diocese of Cincinnati for 10 years had hosts with honey and milk in them. Most probably for 10 years, the Diocese of Cincinnati has not had a single valid mass celebrated. That is their interpretation of Vatican II. Then comes Cardinal Ratzinger and says, no, these are just abuses. At the same time, he says that uh, some parts of Vatican II are an anti-syllabus. The syllabus is nothing else but the, uh, the condemnation, the solemn condemnation of errors in the church by Pius X, Pius IX, excuse me. So the things that have been condemned by, say, by Pius IX now are doctrine of the church. And Ratzinger admits it. So this is their interpretation of Vatican II, not mine. The new rite very often is characterized by Kant celebrations. They say Vatican II didn't want that. Number 57 says, Kant celebrations whereby the unity of the priesthood is appropriately manifested has remained in use to this day in the church, both in the East and in the West. For this reason, it has seemed good to the council to extend permission for celebration in the following cases. I don't bore you with those cases. Now you can celebrate wherever you want. 
And as a matter of fact, that, that's what I call uh, historical irony. In the Episcopal Cathedral of Trent, a friend of mine tried to celebrate Mass there. They told him, no, either you participate in our 9 o'clock in the morning con celebration or you may not celebrate Mass here. This is the church in which the Council of Trent was held. Sometimes I, I'm surprised God did not let it crumble yet, like Assisi. By now, this faculty for the concelebration given by the church has been extended to the point that they even ignore the new code of canon law, which in canon 902 says that no priest may ever be forced to concelebrate. That doesn't change the fact that in very many churches, under the eyes of the bishop in his cathedral, priests are forced to concelebrate, which is why I travel with a travel altar and, sad to say, have celebrated masses in motel rooms. A new right for concelebrations to be drawn up and insert it into the pontifical and into the Roman Missal. Why? We have a right of concelebration in the Latin Church. At an Episcopal consecration, the bishops can celebrate what the bishop consecrate. But, and at the right of priestly ordination, the priests can celebrate with the bishop who just consecrated them. We have the right, except that in the old days, every priest and every bishop was saying the full mass. Now they, they just say the words of consecration and that's about it. And for the rest of the Mass, they've got nothing to do. As a matter of fact, there's nothing more ridiculous. And I've done it every day, almost every day, for 10 years in St. Peter's Basilica, in the sacristy of St. Peter's Basilica. There are very few things more ridiculous and more scandalous to me than watch future concelebrants before Mass. Watch the priests dress up, waiting for concelebration. I don't want to go in this type of comedy, but believe me, it would make a good show on TV. They chat around, very few of them pray, very few of them prepare for anything sacred. When they sit in the, in, uh, in the sanctuary, usually this is what you get. This is called celebrants in mass. And I've just given you uh, one type. There are many others. Some of them don't say anything. Some of them uh, are just snoring through the whole thing. We had a beautiful right of concelebration. If the council had really wanted concelebration, it would not have asked for a new right to be drawn up. It would have used the one existing. Apart from the fact that it is not a tradition in the Latin church to concelebrate, except at ordination and consecration. Number 62 says, with the passage of time, however, there have crept into the rites of the sacraments and sacramentals certain features which have rendered their nature and purpose far from clear, far from clear to the people of today. Hence, some changes are necessary to adapt them to present-day needs. Again, simplify the rights to the point that the village idiot will understand them. The council is very repetitious, as you can see. Number 63. Because the use of the vernacular in the administration of the sacraments and sacramentals can often be of very great help to the people, the use is to be extended according to the following norms. In the administration of the sacraments and sacramentals, the vernacular may be used according to the norm of Article 36. We have read that before. You can look it up. I'll wind back the tape. The competent territorial uh, ecclesiastical authority designated in Article 22.2. I think when you go home tonight, you'll all be dreaming. You're not going to have nightmares about Article 22.2 of the... But Sorry, but uh, I didn't write it. According to Article uh, 22.2 of this Constitution, shall further with prepare, in accordance with the new edition of the Roman Ritual, local rituals adapted linguistically and otherwise to the needs of the different regions. Uh, they have dialect missiles now. I mean, uh, this is something which in the United States is uh, not uh, as bad a problem as it is in other countries because this is more or less still one country. And even though uh, there is quite a difference in the accents here, uh, you don't really have too, too many dialects in this country. But Europe is packed with dialects. And believe me, once you have heard the Mass in Viennese dialect or Sicilian dialect, you are sick. I love the Sicilians, but not the dialect at Mass. You heard that, Benita? <laughs> in number 68, the Council says, the baptismal rite should contain variants to be used at the discretion of the local ordinary. Now it's not 22 too. 
when a large number are to be baptized. The council really thinks that after that council, there will be a large number to be baptized. That's the joke of the century. <laughs> I have just baptized three people in Argonne. <laughs> three, yes, I was busy. Uh, likewise, a shorter rite is to be drawn up, especially for mission countries, which, uh, uh, which uh, catechists and also the faithful in general may use when there is danger of death and neither priest nor deacon is available. I don't see the meaning of this. In my breviary, which I have to use every day as a priest, in the last page it says, in the case of emergency, you just say, Ego te baptizo in nomine patris et filii spiritus sancti, amen. Can you, can you shorten that? No, you can't. If you shorten that, the baptism is invalid. So I don't, I, I, I don't understand. Uh, in a case of an emergency, they, call it, they talk about a case of emergency, so we even need a new right for that? Or maybe because now everything has to be in the vernacular, and in Papua dialect, dialect you baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and tabu, tabu. Yeah, the Papuas don't have a word for a spirit except taboo. They don't have a word for holy except taboo. So you give the taboo, excuse me, the sacrament of that. You give the taboo of baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the taboo, taboo. Shows you the advantages of the vernacular. The right of confirmation is to be revised, blah, blah, in number 71. 72, the right and the formula of penance are to be revised. 76, ordination rights have to be revised. 77, the marriage right has to be revised. Now you know, they all are new rights now. And that has been explicitly condemned by the church. If people use those who, now this will cause me a great number of enemies, but it's the truth. Those who use the new rights and approve of them are materially in schism with the church. The church has said, whoever says that new rights may be created, anathemasit, he may be accursed. Pope Innocent III said, there must not be new rights. Pope Eugene IV praised the Cardinal Torquemada, who said, there must not be new rights. Priests who say the church may write up new rights and may use them, and I may use them, and they may use them, are in material schism with the church. I say material because most of them don't know it. I'm not accusing or condemning any individual here, which of course I know, even though I'm very clear on this in my tape, people will run around and say Father Hesse condemned everybody to hell. Okay, if they want to go on with that slander against the Eighth Commandment, fine. It's not my business. But uh, I do not condemn every priest and I do not condemn any priest. I'm just saying they are in material schism with the church and you better believe it after what I told you. What you, you can check everything I said. I give you footnotes. Tradi divobis quote takcepi. I give you what I have received. I do not make up these things. In 79, the council is even more explicit. The sacraments are to be revised. These sacraments are to be revised. Revised, mind you. Account being taken of the primary principle of enabling the faithful to participate intelligently. That's a joke. Actively and easily. I, we have talked about that. I don't need to repeat it. The circumstances of our times must also be considered. That has been condemned both by Pius VI, Pius IX, and Pius XII. The circumstances of our times must also be considered, not in the liturgy. The eternal sacrifice is the eternal sacrifice. It is the eternal sacrifice of all times. It is not the sacrifice of the 20th century, or the 21st century, or the glorious millennium. When rituals are being revised as laid down in Article 63, we read that before, New sacraments may also be new sacramentals. You have to be careful of that. The council did not say new sacraments. The council said new sacramentals. Sacramentals are blessings and all kinds of things. May also be added as necessity requires. I agree with that, of course. Uh, sacramentals have to be added. In the old, uh, in the old uh, uh, Rituale Romanum, you will not find a proper blessing for uh, uh, a military jet fighter. Because it didn't exist then. So uh, some new blessings indeed have to be drawn up. Provisions should be made for the administration of some sacramentals. Now get this. At least in special circumstances and at the discretion of the ordinary, the bishop may decide by qualified lay persons. Qualified lay persons? If that's not an oxymoron, I ain't heard one yet. Qualified lay persons? Okay, 
uh, get your car blessed by your neighbor. <laughs> I'm sure Mahoney is in agreement with that. <laughs> oh, excuse me, uh, his most reverend eminence. Sorry. This is really disgusting, but it is, it is, it is, I have to, I have to give this to you. I have to read it to you. Number 91. So that it may be possible in practice to observe the course of the hours proposed in Article 89, the Psalms are no longer to be distributed throughout the week, but through a longer period of time. I mentioned before, and I said I will come back to this, that the priest in his breviary says the Psalms. That's why St. Gregory the Great wanted the bishops to memorize them. The oldest rule of the breviary is that you say the 150 Psalms in a week, that there may never be a week in your priestly life without having said all of the 150 Psalms. Number one purpose of the breviary is that some ultra traditionalists who go far beyond what uh, is due and what is right, criticize St. Pius X for having reformed the breviary. They say this was against the explicit will of Pius V. St. Pius V, and here we have an example when it is needed to reform things according to the times. When St. Pius V was Pope, priests did not have cars. Priests spent a lot of their time walking, traveling. In those days, you had to walk to the next village. A priest has to say prayers seven times a day. He has to give praise to God seven times a day in the breviary. Prima, tertia, sexta, nona, vespere, completorium, matutine, laudes. Those are what is called the hours of the breviary. In the old days, in order to enable the priest to be able to say at least part of this breviary every day without needing the text of the breviary, the prima, tertia, sexta, and nona, as the name says, the prayers that should be, but do not have to, but should be said at 7 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and 3 p.m. Those prayers were the same every day except Sunday. So priests, after a while being priests, memorized them, and on their way to the next parish or the next church, could recite them by memory. Also, in those days, it was very difficult and very expensive to obtain a printed breviary. In the 20th century, to obtain a printed breviary is neither expensive nor difficult, except if you want an old breviary, then it might be difficult today, but that's not the point. At the time of uh, St. Pius X, it was easy for a priest to receive his, to, to obtain a, a breviary, and Pius X did not write up a new breviary. He re restored the breviary to a new organization of the Psalms, a new distribution of the Psalms during the week. So you did not repeat the same Psalm all uh, over and over again, Monday through Saturday, but you just said the 150 Psalms. Before St. Pius X, the prayer at night did not have nine, but 12 Psalms. It was endless. And during the day, you repeated the same Psalm over again. Pius X rightly understood that the purpose of the breviary is to make you say 150 psalms during the week, not 170 and not 130. This is now the purpose of the breviary. But hear, hear what Vatican II says, 91. So that it may be possible in practice to observe the course of the hours proposed in Article 89, possible in practice, that means because the priests today are drowned in bureaucracy and paperwork, so they don't have time for the breviary anymore, in the, for the old breviary, so the breviary had to be shortened and made simpler. The, the, the Psalms are no longer to be distributed throughout the week, but through a longer period of time. Now a priest says all the 150 Psalms, excuse me, 147 Psalms, because the council considered, uh, uh, not the council, the, the liturgical reformers con considered three Psalms, I've forgotten the number, that condemned the heretics to hell, scandalous, and took them out of the breviary. So in the new breviary, you have 147 psalms, not 150. This is against a standing tradition of 2,000 2, years in the Latin church. And now the priest says 150 psalms in three weeks, or four weeks, I don't remember. 
This is against the standing tradition of 2,000 years in the church. This is, at first sight, it means nothing. But if you give it a closer look, this is one of the most scandalous paragraphs of this document. In number 92C, the council says, the accounts of the martyrdom or lives of the saints are to be made historically accurate. That means we have all been fed, you know what, uh, until the council. Fairy tales, fairy tales. And now we have a scientific platform. Now our bravery is giving us a scientific account of the saints. We have seen what the scientific account of sanctity is when they recently just said that the Shroud of Turin is a, a, a falsification, and other experts came up and said, no way. They were just wrong about the, the carbon-14 method. This is modern science. In 1989, you say, this is the way it should be. In 1997, you say, no, they were absolutely wrong. And in 2003, they will again come up with a new theory. Uh, I trust tradition. I trust the stories being handed down from the early Roman martyrs. And I cannot possibly tell you what I think about science dealing with the, the saints' biographies. It would be offensive language. I would have to use the vernacular. <laughs> <laughs> Hymns. Now, in, in the breviary, you do not only have the, the Psalms, but you also have Latin poetry. Gorgeous poetry. Magnificent poetry. Poetry so beautiful that nothing in the 20th century comes close to it, even. These are the hymns. Hymns are to be restored to their original form. That's another one of these archaeologisms, as Pius XII would have called it in Mediator Day. As far as may be desirable, whatever that means, they are to be purged of whatever smacks of mythology or accords ill with the Christian piety. <laughs> well, I'm saying, the, I'm saying the old breviary every day, and I haven't found a single hymn that I found uh, uh, offensive to my piety. I made the mistake and said the new bravery in Latin until I found out it's disgusting, offensive to my piety, and in vernacular translations, even heretical. This is what the council got in exchange for one of the most beautiful part, uh, pieces of poetry in the history of mankind. Then again, in paragraph number uh, 101, 1 and 2 and 3, we talk again about the vernacular and uh, this may come as a surprise to you. They quote again 22.2. <laughs> Number 112 says, The church indeed approves of all forms of true art which have the, requ uh, the requisite qualities and admits them into divine worship. This is why churches today look what they look. I recommend you an ex extended tour through New England. These New England villages are so cute. They're so beautiful. You have all the Protestant, heretical, and, and uh, very often pagan churches there. Beautiful buildings. And then you find one hideous monstrosity there. It is the Catholic Church or the local cement factory. <laughs> but usually the local cement factory looks much better. Most of the times the local church is the most hideous building around. Just to show you how the church interpreted this paragraph 112. The church indeed approves of all forms of true art. Well, if they had stuck to this paragraph, they would have had to tear down the churches built before the council already, post-war. Some of them were absolutely hideous and disgusting, but no comparison to what we got after the council. Number 113, as regards the language to be used, the provisions of Article 36 are to be observed for the Mass, Article 54, for the Sacraments, Article 63, and for the Divine Office, Article 101. That means we get the vernacular again. 119. In certain countries, especially in mission lands, there are people who have their own musical tradition. And, these, and this plays a great part in their religious and social life. For this reason, their music should be held in proper esteem. Oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints, and so on. And this plays a great part in their religious and social life. For this reason, this, should, this music should be held in proper esteem, and a suitable place to be given to it, not only informing their religious sins, but also in adapting worship to their native genius. That's the native genius. As indicated in Articles 39 and 40. My talents of imitation are not good enough to give you another, uh, other examples of different type of Aborigine music 
that you will find now inserted in mass. Not that I'm against, uh, against local traditions, believe me. Actually, I'm a real fan of country music. I am. But if I hear it in church, I get sick. <laughs> Life is like a mountain railroad with an engineer who's brave and so on. <laughs> Keep your hand upon the throttle from the cradle to the grave. <laughs> Therefore, in the musical training of missionaries, Great care should be taken to see that they become competent in promoting the traditional music of these people, both in schools and in sacred services, so far as it may be practicable. Offertory. It's local music, isn't it? Why not have it at the offertory for change? But other instruments also may be admitted for use in divine worship. This is what I meant. Drums, guitars, guitars. In the judgment, electric guitars, mind you. In the judgment and with the consent of the competent territor territorial authority as laid down, this is very new to us here, in Article 22.2. <laughs> this may be done, however, only on condition that these instruments are suitable and or be made suitable for sacred use. Well, they certainly made all these instruments use, suitable for their kind of sacred use. And that they accord with the dignity of the temple. Yeah, that's what I would call it now. The dignity of the temple and they truly contribute to the edification of the faithful. St. Pius X, wanted Gregorian. St. Pius the, uh, excuse me, he's not saint. Pius XI wanted Gregorian. Pius XII wanted Gregorian. Pius VI made a feeble attempt to make it believable that he wants Gregorian. Well, I haven't heard Gregorian in a long time. Number 123 is again another paragraph on inculturation. The art of our own times from every race and country shall also be given free scope in the church. They did that. Provided it bring to the task the reverence and honor due to the sacred buildings and rites. Thus it is enabled to join its voice to that wonderful chorus and praise in honor of the Catholic faith sung by great men in past ages. How was this? They will say, vicious, vicious Dr. Hesse again says that the council wanted all the, be all the, one all the, 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 the disgusting new churches. Vicious Dr. Hesse again is not able to distinguish and abuse from what the council wanted. I say again, I am not the interpreter of the council. The popes and the, bish the, popes and the bishops are. I have, it has not come to my notice that the pope would have condemned any one of these hideous churches, and that he would have told the bishop, do not consecrate this. In the canton of Zug in Switzerland, Z-U-G, the local bishop consecrated a church on which walls there were obscene drawings. He did not ask for the removal of these drawings. He said, put up a few curtains. And then he consecrated the church. There are consecrated new Catholic churches where a swimming pool is to be found under the altar. Switzerland again, this was in the 1970s. In number 128, Council says, the canons and ecclesiastical statutes which govern the provision of external things which pertain to sacred worship should be revised as soon as possible, together with the liturgical books as laid down in Article 25. These laws refer especially to the worthy and well-planned construction of sacred buildings, well-planned, the shape and construction of altars, the nobility, placing, and security of the Eucharistic tabernacle, the suitability and dignity of the baptistry, the proper ordering of the sacred language, of the sacred images, I'm sorry, and the scheme of decoration and embellishment. Uh, the next paragraph, I uh, spare you the next paragraph, 22.2. <laughs> Look uh, at, uh, try to find a book, a modern book, a book coin, or whatever they call it. Try to find a book on recent ecclesiastical architecture and flip through the book and compare the interiors of modern churches. Now, of course, they're very, very different from each other because every architect wants to present his masterpiece of art. <laughs> and uh, so he makes sure that he doesn't copy uh, uh, other people's uh, um, uh, plans. But you'll always find the same hideous altar facing the people with two ashtrays and candles on one side, flowers on the other, you will find the ambo 
where uh, Madame Reader reads the readings. And then you will find the tabernacle somewhere over there. And in many churches, when you look into the church, you will not know where to find the center of the church. It's an octagon, it's a polygon. There's the altar here, the amber over there, tabernacle somewhere there. You enter the church, you have to search, not just to look, to search for the tabernacle. Where is the tabernacle? Most of the times you will not find the tabernacle because you're not able to imagine that such a hideous thing could be a tabernacle. You will find the altar, not like, I mean, we, we are not celebrating Mass here, and yet this table is, uh, it, it's symmetric, it's centered. Uh, with some churches, you will find the altar over there, then the tabernacle over there, it must never be in the middle, you know, tabernacle over there, and the ambo right here. But then it might not right, be right here in the center, it will be somewhat off-center. This is the interpretation given to the vast majority, to give, given to this paragraph by the vast majority of bishops. Because, as you should know, no church can be constructed and consecrated without the bishop's approval. The majority of the churches in our days look like I described them. So this is the authentic interpretation. The Pope has never refused to celebrate in one of these hideous monstrosities that are rightly called temple here and are not churches. Again, I do not interpret this. They do. And to conclude this torturous reading of one of the most imbecile documents in church history, I read the appendix to you. Why? I'm sure you heard the term time bomb. Archbishop Lefebvre said that there are many things in Vatican II that you should consider spiritual time bombs. They don't mean much in the context of the council, but they can be interpreted in a way that will be disastrous. I'll give you a time bomb that has not yet exploded, but will. The Second Vatican Council, the sacred, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. The sacred Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, by the way, the word ecumenical does not mean the council is ecumenical, like we understand wrongly today. The word ecumenical council means it's coming from the Greek term oikos, house. Oikomene is the household. I don't have a housekeeper, so I uh, do my own cooking and I clean my apartment, so I'm my own housekeeper, I'm my own housefrau. Uh, I am responsible for my own oikomene, things pertaining to the house. And ecumenical council means things pertaining to the house. Ecumenical means that everybody who is in union with the Pope is invited, and the others are not. So the word ecumenical should mean everything pertaining to the Catholic Church. And here's the great theological lies of our, lie of our days that I will talk about uh, uh, in the second part. The Ecumenical Council means everything pertaining to the Catholic Church. Today, that means the sister churches and nephew and niece churches and whatever. And that's exactly why ecumenism is what it is today. The original meaning means just pertaining to the Catholic Church. The Sacred Second Vatican Ecumenical Council recognizes the importance of the wishes expressed by many concerning the assignment of the Feast of Easter to a fixed Sunday and concerning an unchanging calendar, having carefully considered, etc., etc. So that's the next time bomb to explode. Easter will not be as, as used to be after the first full moon. It might be something like uh, April 7th every year. That would break a tradition as old as the church itself. This time bomb is to come. In my second part, I will spare you of detailed reading. I gave you the first document considered by some to be harmless, not heretical, not damaging. Well, if this is harmless, then what must the others be like? Tomorrow, or in the next part, in the next part, in the, in the second part, anyway, I'm going to talk about the unacceptable pronouncements of Vatican II in the other documents. Thank you. <laughs>